um, and I manage the um, teaching and research project side. Um, so among those is the Research Your Path series. And what this is, is just a series of interesting and educational talks um, on current research um, in various different fields and what their future research um, initiatives might involve. Um, this series is also um, interactive in that we provide teaching opportunities for students to apply to um, and that they can give talks themselves in their interested field as a way of gaining teaching experience to boost your CV and um, also gain points for medical portfolios. Um, speaking of which, Speaking of which, we do have an opportunity for a cardiac research talk um, on kinase signaling and heart failure with Dr. Uh, Oshindi. Um, if you're interested in this, you can check out our social media, which will have all the links in our bio. Um, additionally, a feedback email will be sent out after the talk, which will provide links to all of our opportunities as well. Um, on the research side of things, we have an exciting opportunity for students to be part of critical care um, medicine project. This will be on clinical informatics um, in critical care and how they contribute to research and innovation um, with Dr. Wilson at the Manchester Royal Infirmary. Um, this roles, uh, these roles will involve data collection, organization, analysis and coordinating um, clinical studies if needed. The project is fairly flexible in that Dr. Wilson um, is willing to talk to um, various students um, about what they're interested in and how they'd like to contribute to the project. At the end, you can be guaranteed your name being on the paper as a published author, or you can be given an opportunity to present findings via uh, an oral presentation during a conference, or you, you can even take part in audit. Um, if you're inter interested in any of these things, please check out our social media for links to apply. Um, additionally, again, the feedback email will provide you with all the links after you complete the feedback form. Um, so that's all from me now. Um, thank you very much for coming. And I'll hand you over to Asta, um, who will provide you with all the links after you can, oh, sorry, um, who will introduce your speakers for you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so um, Dr. Dalia Ersenfrieda is a, uh, is a chartered psychologist and a postdoctoral public health researcher, um, teaching communication skills to medical students at the University of Manchester. Her academic research is mainly concerned with social epidemiology and the public health aspects of hearing loss, focusing on hearing uh, health uh, inequalities. She has an extensive background in hearing health in later life, health psychology, social epidemiology, health policy, and health services planning, and multi-year experience delivering innovative research and lifestyle factors in hearing loss. Uh, she will present the conceptual model of hearing health inequalities, which, will, uh, which depicts modifiable factors for hearing loss from birth, con uh, from birth to older adulthood. She also present vicious cycles between socioeconomic uh, inequalities and hearing health. Um, we also have a medical student today, uh, Mahwan, uh, who's, who's in the second year at the moment. Um, and he's also the education director of Ria Academics Manchester. Uh, and, uh, he's interested in uh, pursuing teaching and research as well. So over to you. Thank you very much, Asta. Um, so just before we start, um, I just want to launch a poll here um, to see, and then we'll do another one at the end, just to see the opinion, general opinion on our topic. So um, I'll just launch it there now. And if everyone could take a minute just to fill it out. It's only three questions, so. Just give her another minute or so. Still more, 10 more participants to fill it out.
Okay, just 10 more seconds. If you can please fill out the poll just so that we can, uh, it's really useful for our data. Okay, so I'll just end the poll there. And um, now if Dr. Dahlia, um, if you can go ahead, if you could share a screen. Yeah, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, as I'm sharing my screen, would you like to uh, explain the, the purpose, the aims of uh, the, today's uh, uh, event? Of course. Um, so today we've just organized this talk um, for World Hearing Day. Um, this is a day on the 3rd of March in which we're spreading awareness um, across the world. Really many different events are being held across the world and ours is one of them. So we're very glad to be a part of this uh, prestigious occasion. And it's essentially just to spread awareness about hearing and um, how essentially it has a huge wide lasting um, implications, um, both socially and uh, in the health context as well. And so hopefully um, our purpose today is to just to help spread awareness um, as well as to help um, you guys become more informed. So hopefully whenever you do come into practice or if you're already a practicing practitioner that um, you could take these into consideration hopefully in the future. So um, I'll now hand over to Dr. Dahlia who is a world renowned uh, researcher in this area. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to this event. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about an important part of uh, our lives. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about uh, hearing. And uh, hearing is important because hearing connects us. We humans are made for relationship and uh, hearing for those uh, not born deaf uh, and fluent in sign language is central to the sharing of uh, emotions and ideas and uh, happenings. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Dalia Tsimbida, and uh, I'm really passionate about uh, research that transforms the lives of uh, people with uh, hearing difficulties. Uh, the 3rd of March, it's a year, uh, marks the World Hearing Day, a day that is important for more than 460 million people uh, uh, with uh, hearing loss around the world and for those with whom they communicate. It is important to uh, highlight that uh, no matter the age uh, of uh, onset of hearing loss, when somebody loses their hearing, not only the ear function itself is affected, but also the related activities. For example, uh, understanding speech during communication is reduced and uh, the participation of the individual in society is affected. People with a hearing loss have limited uh, employment opportunities, and there are many barriers in education, in attending social events, or receiving uh, health services. This holistic and uh, patient-centered approach uh, will inform my presentation today, which has the title, Hearing Loss in Adults, a Major Public Health Issue and a Challenge for the Medical Profession. I will present you today why do socioeconomic and lifestyle factors matter and evidence uh, I produced during my doctoral studies at the University of Manchester uh, using the English longitudinal study of aging for the role of a socioeconomic position in terms of uh, etiology, the early diagnosis of hearing loss and mental health inequalities in those with a hearing loss. So hearing loss is far beyond a sensory impairment because it has many physical, social, cognitive, economic, and uh, emotional consequences and affects the quality of life. It is the third most common chronic health condition after high blood pressure and arthritis and is the first leading cause of morbidity among adults 70 years old and older and the second leading cause among adults 50 to 69 years old. Today, hearing loss is a major global health challenge. It is estimated that affects uh, the life of over 460 million people globally and those with whom they communicate. Unless action is taken, this number could cross 900 million by 2050. 
I and my colleagues proposed a novel theoretical framework supporting the argument that a substantial proportion of hearing loss in older adults is preventable by tackling the socioeconomic inequalities in hearing health. Now I will explain why a socioeconomic approach is crucial for planning sustainable models of hearing care. The unequal distribution of power, money, and resources in the society leads to social inequalities. As a result, some groups of people are more privileged than others, which creates injustice and the disadvantage that influences life experiences and their health outcomes. Some critical uh, indicators of uh, socioeconomic position include uh, the educational status, occupation, and income. Hearing health inequalities is an emerging uh, research area, and uh, I and my colleagues recently proposed a definition saying that the hearing health inequalities are the avoidable differences in people's hearing health across different social or population groups. The mechanisms by which these inequalities are generated remain unclear so far. And using a critical interpretive synthesis methodology during my PhD, I examined the mechanisms to explain the relationship between uh, socioeconomic inequalities and uh, hearing health in a life course perspective through a conceptual model. Uh, this model provides a visual representation of the several modifiable factors of hearing loss in distinct life stages across the life course and uh, their evolution over time, which is uh, a new thinking in hearing and audiological research. Now I will explain uh, this novel model and the modifiable factors in its uh, developmental stage. Uh, first of all, children uh, in childhood. Uh, children born to, born to parents from a lower socioeconomic background uh, tend to experience more illness and injuries and uh, the antibiotic drugs used may affect the hearing health, especially in sick babies with a genetic predisposition. In turn, consequences of hearing loss in children can include the impairment in their language skills and the lower educational achievement compared to children with a normal hearing. The lower educational status is also related to the lower health literacy, which is a common issue among people of a lower socioeconomic position. And that can explain why individuals of a lower socioeconomic position adopt an unhealthy lifestyle with higher levels of smoking and alcohol consumption, higher body mass index, and lower levels of physical activity, which are all risk factors for hearing loss. The lower educational level is a predictor of uh, social inequality uh, in uh, later life, as uh, limits the employment opportunities, uh, relegating people to more poorly paid jobs. Furthermore, uh, low level manual jobs are those uh, with a, a higher level of occupational noise exposure, and noise is a risk factor for hearing loss. Uh, occupation and income may affect then access to hearing health services and hearing aids use due to financial barriers that affect the help-seeking behavior for hearing loss difficulties. These hearing health inequalities can affect the retirement status and income in older adulthood, as you can see in the fourth panel, uh, as uh, the inequalities affect the ability of people to continue working or to advance occupationally. Uh, also, hearing loss affects communication in healthcare settings uh, and so affects the quality of uh, care and the management of many other health conditions that are commonly comorbid with hearing loss. For example, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's and dementia, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease depression, and many other chronic health conditions 
that uh, are usually comorbid with hearing loss in uh, later life. As uh, hearing health deteriorates, this lowers socioeconomic status uh, further and uh, results in a worsening cumulative hearing health over the life course. This is why I selected uh, different uh, uh, colors uh, of orange to see the cumulative factors across the life course and how the low socioeconomic position then affects uh, hearing health. And this leads to a lower socioeconomic position again in a vicious cycle. This brings the life course approach in hearing health and uh, can lead to the development of appropriate interventions and public health strategies that can, uh, can have significant uh, health policy and practice uh, implications. This is a, a theoretical model. And uh, during my PhD, uh, I tried to, to verify the role of uh, socioeconomic and lifestyle factors. So I presented uh, the first study in uh, audiology that uh, uh, brought uh, a sociological perspective uh, in uh, audiological research. Uh, and I examined the association of objectively measured uh, hearing loss with uh, four different socioeconomic position indicators, education, occupation, income, and wealth. And they explored also the role of uh, several uh, modifiable uh, factors, uh, such as uh, tobacco consumption, body mass index, uh, physical inactivity, and the uh, alcohol consumption above the low risk level guidelines, which is uh, 14 units uh, per week. So what uh, we found uh, is that those in a lower socioeconomic position were up to two times more likely to have hearing loss at the same age. And the adjusted odds ratio of hearing loss were higher for those with no qualifications versus those with a degree or higher education, those in routine or manual occupations versus those in managerial occupations, and those in the lowest versus the highest income and wealth quintiles. So vast inequalities across different uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, position. And uh, the study also showed that uh, hearing loss among older adults is as strongly associated with uh, socioeconomic and lifestyle factors as with core demographic factors such as age and gender. In simple words, uh, this study revealed for the first time that uh, age was not the most important risk factor for what is widely known as age-related hearing loss. The term age-related hearing loss is not a, an inclusive term to express uh, the many hearing problems without a specific etiology in older age. And uh, therefore, uh, I decided to, to coin and to introduce to the literature a new, new term, uh, the term lifestyle-related hearing loss. Uh, here, lifestyle refers to social practices and ways of living uh, adopted by individuals that reflect uh, personal, group, and socioeconomic uh, identities. Uh, in other words, there are many modifiable factors that affect uh, the, the degree uh, of hearing loss one may have in later life. So it's not uh, uh, inevitably the, age, the aging process, but there are many other factors that can be uh, fully modifiable or partly modifiable. Uh, let's now see the socioeconomic inequalities in diagnosis, which is uh, also important uh, for you as uh, future, uh, the do doctors of the future. So in a recent study, we examined patterns of uh, he uh, health pathways among older adults in England using uh, hearing data of uh, 8,529 participants aged 50 to 89 years old from the English Longitudinal Study of uh, Aging. This is a big data set a representative of the English older population in England. And uh, we found that uh, up to a third of older adults with hearing loss in England could be undetected and untreated. Uh, in that study, uh, I found that uh, although participants had objectively been identified as having hearing loss, uh, moderate hearing loss over 35 decibels hearing level, 
they did not self-identify their own difficulties correctly. And uh, the same person, the same people that had the uh, hearing loss reported in the self-reported questionnaire that they had uh, good, very good or excellent hearing, despite, despite the fact that the, uh, the measure, the measurement, the objective measurement showed that they had a, a disabling hearing loss. Significant predictors for this uh, misreporting were female sex, so women uh, did not uh, recognize their hearing difficulties correctly, uh, people with no educational qualifications, People working in uh, routine or manual occupations responded that they have a good, very good or excellent hearing, despite they had disabling hearing loss. Uh, those uh, uh, with uh, tobacco consumption and alcohol intake above the low risk level guidelines, and those with, uh, with uh, lacking mo uh, moderate physical activity. So lots of uh, socioeconomic and lifestyle factors affected uh, the total misreporting. This lack of uh, self-awareness of hearing loss is a problem for many people. And it is crucial that those with uh, hearing loss are detected uh, in a timely way, referred to ER specialists. So uh, the, the early diagnosis takes place in primary care. And the GP, in the GP practices, uh, the GPs uh, refer people to secondary care for further audiological examination from ER specialists so as to, to be given access to hearing aids, uh, which are provided for free in, uh, in the UK. However, uh, it is crucial uh, that those with hearing loss are detected in a timely way, but uh, we need to identify why people uh, don't realize early that they have a hearing uh, problem. The reason is that uh, many people believe that uh, Hearing loss refers only to inability to hear sounds in terms of the intensity of a sound, how loud is a sound uh, in decibels. However, this is not correct because, uh, the, because hearing loss refers not only to the intensity of a sound, but also to the frequency of sound in, he in hertz. The range of sounds of the average human speech can be represented in a banana-shaped region known as the speech banana. When you have a hearing loss of only certain frequencies, uh, it is harder to detect yourself because the other frequencies that remain unaffected appear pure and clear. And this may lead you to the impression that uh, your hearing is completely normal, which may lead to a wrong self-diagnosis. So maybe people think that the, the hearing loss is not too bad. And uh, as a hearing loss nearly always develops gradually, people don't see it as a dramatic health problem requiring urgent intervention. And uh, they persevere with declined hearing for approximately 10 years before they seek help and take up a hearing aid. There is no uh, national screening program for hearing loss, and those who are diagnosed are usually diagnosed by their own doctor. Uh, this is important for you because if the patient doesn't bring the matter up, the doctor might not ask about it. So you need to be aware of uh, all these uh, uh, potential hearing difficulties uh, and uh, to, to be able to ask the right questions to the patients and to uh, screen them in primary care uh, in order to see if there is a reason for referral to secondary care. More research is needed to understand why so many people are undiagnosed, uh, though I and my colleagues feel that uh, making hearing loss part of a routine primary care examination among uh, older adults would be really beneficial. Regarding now the socioeconomic inequalities in mental health, this is a, a, a huge issue as well. Uh, and my recent research uh, findings provided uh, robust evidence that the hearing loss directly causes depression, which differs according to socioeconomic position. Uh, a graded relationship between hearing loss and depression, according to socioeconomic position, was revealed 
uh, with those with hearing loss in the lowest wealth groups experiencing up to double the relative risk for, uh, of depression compared to those in the highest wealth quintile. So people of the same age, if they belong uh, in a lower socioeconomic position, uh, have uh, uh, up to double the relative risk for, uh, of depression. Therefore, the early detection of uh, hearing loss by primary care professionals in a routine assessment may not only promote better hearing health and uh, opportunities for better communication, but also may prevent or delay the onset of depression uh, in later life. So there is a clear need for establishing evidence-based uh, programs for hearing screening. And uh, this is underscored by the new National Study of Hearing in England, which uh, we published uh, recently, published in January, uh, in the International Journal of Audiology. And uh, the study revealed that uh, people in the north of England are more likely to have worse hearing, closer to 50 years old, than those with similar age profiles living in the south. This is linked to a history of socioeconomic and uh, health disparities between the north and south part uh, of the country. In this uh, short talk, uh, I presented uh, my recent uh, research findings for the role of socioeconomic position in terms of uh, etiology, early diagnosis, and uh, mental health inequalities in those uh, with uh, hearing loss. Uh, hearing is uh, an important part of our lives, and uh, it is important to, uh, uh, to, to early diagnose any hearing difficulty so as to be able to enjoy life and uh, be connected to the world. Uh, as a take-home message, I would like uh, to highlight that uh, hearing deterioration is a lifelong process. It is not an inevitable result of aging, uh, as previously thought, and understanding this process uh, is an essential step uh, in addressing the burden of a hearing loss and the management of related comorbidities in later life, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, depression, and the many other conditions that are uh, connected uh, due or in parallel to, to hearing loss in uh, later life. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Uh, I'm uh, really glad uh, and uh, happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Uh, now or uh, at the end of the presentation, if you want to, to write uh, in the chat box any question, I would be glad to take it and answer it now or later. Thank you very much, Dalia. That was a really inspirational and eye-opening. Um, I think we'll take questions at the end, hopefully, okay. so at the end of both. Okay. Um, so I'll just get my presentation up now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, hopefully now I'll just be broadening the perspective um, of hearing loss towards the, the greater public. Um, you might think that, uh, or some people may think that hearing loss is quite a niche um, thing. However, um, hopefully with the coming slides, you'll understand how it actually has huge implications on public health. Um, so I'm just gonna start off by reiterating the slide from Dahlia. Um, as we can see here, um, I'll hopefully be going into this list of things that hearing loss has a huge effect on. As we can see here, it has huge physical, social, cognitive, economic, and emotional consequences. Um, and hopefully I'll be delving a bit further into these. Um, it is the third most common chronic health condition, and these are huge names, uh, high blood pressure and art and um, arthritis, so it's important, highlighting hearing loss, hearing loss is important. So, and as we've said, that a third of over 50s with hearing loss could be undiagnosed. And that is the newspaper article that Dr. Daly had showed. Okay. <clears throat> so the early detection of a decrease in hearing is quite important as it hugely affects the clinical setting. Um, Poor communication within the consultation could leave a patient quite confused about their condition, and it could also lead to them being um, unsure about the instructions that the um, healthcare professional has given them. 
as we can see here in this illustration, I'm sure this is um, a situation that we've all been put in before. And so you can just imagine the patient could also um, be afraid to ask any clarifying questions. And so it's important as health professionals to um, make sure that the patient has understand and understood what we have said. Um, so about going back to what Dr. Dali has said about making sure um, you have you know, detected if there is any hearing loss within the patient and how we can target that. This next figure here um, just displays how difficult it is for uh, patients with that are hard of hearing. So if you could just take a second to try and read this. And as you can see, um, reading that figure is quite hard. And so you can just imagine what it is like for people who are hard of hearing, especially in the clinical setting, whenever they are getting you know, different names of drugs and um, dosages, milligrams, micrograms. These are important details that may be missed out during the consultations, which could have like a huge effect on the patient, the quality of the care that the patient receives in the future. So this does raise the question towards us as clinical professionals. Are we being heard by all of our patients? Um, especially in the UK with an, quite an aging demographic, um, hearing loss is a condition more common in the older ages. And so it is becoming more frequently come across um, in our clinics. It is not only crucial for the patient, but also crucial for us as medical professionals, as important uh, communication is important for getting the symptoms and accurate diagnosis. So we need to really um, evaluate ourselves as professionals or future professionals, that are we really communicating effectively um, are we clear and concise with our patients and are we using easily understood language? So it is really important for a doctor to really self-reflect. Here are more illustrations to show um, how difficult it is for the people that are hard of hearing. And so um, it was not surprising at all when Dr. Dahlia had recently found that people that are hard of hearing and deaf are actually overall dissatisfied with the way the health uh, providers communicate with them, and they do not have trust or confidence in health professionals. In a, in a system where we value trust so highly with um, different legislation, such as con confidentiality, losing the patient trust and their confidence is a huge thing. And this can also lead to it translating in any other conditions that the patient is being treated for, um, such as their heart disease or whatever. And so it can not only affect them, it's not simply just the patient not being able to hear, it can also lead to a wider effect into their overall health care. Problems with communication can also lead to poor adherence uh, with patients, especially in the older demographic, as I've just mentioned. Um, polypharmacy is quite a common thing. And so this leads to the double challenge of remembering and comprehending what the doctor has said, especially as I've mentioned before with the different difficult drug names that um, an elderly person could be prescribed on. And polypharmacy, just for clarification, is when a person is um, prescribed with many different drugs uh, to combat many different conditions. So it does not only have huge health um, impacts on the patient, but also has huge impacts on society in general. As we can see, the economic impact of uh, hearing loss can amount to about 150 million pounds a year. And that is quite huge. And this illustration here that we can see at the bottom, it illustrates that the people with the small rucksacks are the people with that are not hard of hearing and the people with the large rucksacks are hard of hearing. And as we can see here, although the hard of hearing patients um, have more burden, they have less access to health services. And so this is quite a powerful illustration. As already mentioned, um, hearing can also provide, um, be a huge driver of other health problems, for example, depression. And as we can see here, um, the purple bars are the patients who are hard of hearing compared with people who have normal hearing. And they can be up to 40 to 8 to 58% more likely to have depression. It is also um, quite sad to say that there's a graded relationship between the socioeconomic status and the likelihood of a person that's hard of hearing to have depression. And so this links back to the conceptual hearing health inequalities model that um, social inequalities could have a huge impact on people's health, especially when they are hard of hearing. 
In addition, hearing loss is not only linked with depression, but it also can be a huge signal um, for upcoming cardiovascular disease. It can also predispose to Alzheimer's and dementia and also have even cognitive deficits um, upon the patients. They may have diabetes at 32% more likely um, for hospital hospitalization, 43% more likely for chronic kidney, kidney disease and three times more likely to fall. Of course, I've already mentioned depression and unfortunately it also has a higher mortality rate. <clears throat> So this online user commented that the biggest barrier to people with age-related, I'm assuming hearing loss, is their GPs. GPs have limited understanding of the associated, associated problems that come with hearing loss. Their attitude is, well, you can hear me okay. This is, I apologize, that's the customary accidental lecture slide skip. So this is quite um, poignant, and especially in our healthcare system in the UK where Achieving goals is quite um, an important thing. Uh, GPs are constantly aiming for 10 minute consultations um, to reduce the number of prescriptions. And so we sacrifice a lot of the quantity of care and the, the quantity of minutes that patients receive. However, we should not um, sacrifice the quality. And that is where our um, consultation skills learning within medical school comes in, where we should have a lot of patient centeredness. And this is, can help really tackle the problems um, that are presented to us by hearing loss. <clears throat> so it's important to understand the magnitude of the problem in England and globally, as hearing loss affects both the functional, it affects the functional ability that enables well-being in older age. As shown by here by the International Federation of Aging, and um, this is a statement of intent that they're trying to tackle this large public issue. The World Health Organization World Report on Hearing had actually emphasized that functional ability of older adults is not maximized unless individuals have good hearing. The report highlights that it is possible to have good hearing across the life course through integrated people-centered ear and hearing care. This position aligns with the UN Decade of Healthy Aging, which is from 2021 to 2030, which aims to maximize the functional abilities of older people through the delivery of person-centered integrated health and social care. This is again, um, emphasizing the importance of patient-centered consultations and cooperation within a multidisciplinary team with age-friendly environments. So we're close to the wrap up. And these are just some key messages from the World Health Organization um, due to World Hearing Day, which is um, obviously the thing that's the, the event that's gathered us here today. And these key messages are that it's, it is possible to have good hearing across the life course through ear and hearing care. Many common causes of hearing loss can be prevented, including hearing loss caused by exposure to loud sounds, um, such as at events or even listening through headphones. Safe listening can mitigate the risk of hearing loss associated with recreational sound exposure. The World Health Organization also calls upon governments, industry partners, and civil society to raise awareness for and implement evidence-based standards that promote safe listening. This is something that Dr. Dahlia has been actively um, taking a part in and what has gathered us today. So the take home message for me is First of all, that hopefully I've highlighted how important hearing is. It has both physical, all physical, social, cognitive, economic, and emotional consequences. And hopefully that message has been conveyed. It is important for us to use our hearing to listen and ensure that we incorporate the patient-centeredness that we are constantly being taught in medical school. Following the patient narrative is an essential process to this uh, aspect of this. Although the current generations of doctors have undergone this training, there is still a huge gap between teaching and application of this in the clinical setting. And so this is quite a large, it's quite poignant actually that um, there is still a huge gap. And so even though we are going through this training, it's important that we actually take the, the extra step in applying it whenever we are not being um, examined for OSCEs, because this is something that generally when we take the Hippocratic Oath, it's something that we do as our duty of care to the patient. This message is applicable to all health workers and not just medical students in the upcoming generation. 
<clears throat> the vision is to have a world which no person experiences hearing loss due to preventable causes. And those with unavoidable hearing loss can achieve, uh, can achieve their full potential through appropriate interventions, education and empowerment. And that is the end of my slide. So thank you very much uh, for listening. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We've now just um, got another poll just to see if um, the opinion has changed. However, uh, before that, would you guys like to have any questions answered? Um, if you could just place them in the chat, if you would like. <clears throat> I think um, I'd like to read this message out, actually, that Hazel sent in today. Okay, here we Well, I'll read Hazel's message first. Um, Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for this event. I have hearing difficulties and wearing hearing aids for about 15 years, and it affects my social life as I usually feel afraid to interact with people because sometimes I feel embarrassed to ask them to repeat what they say, and most of the times I'm misheard, I misheard which makes the situation much worse for me. Um, thank you very much, Hazel, for sharing that with us. That's, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hopefully, like, the, the steps that we're taking, such as today, um, can hopefully make the experience better for everyone in the future and even now uh, within the clinical setting. Um, Dahlia, we do have a question here. Um, what sorts of questions could you ask in consultations to gather information about hearing loss? Yes, uh, so you can ask uh, uh, a patient to indicate in a five uh, Liger point scale uh, when uh, one indicates excellent and five indicates poor, so as to uh, to rate themselves uh, if they have any difficulties. If they say four or five, uh, one is excellent, two is very good, three good, four is fair, and five is poor. So if they say uh, four or five, which means fair or poor, uh, that means that they have a uh, a significant uh, difficulty in their daily lives. And another question that may be uh, uh, important to realize whether they have an issue in specific frequencies is to ask them if they find it uh, difficult to follow a conversation, if there is background noise, such as uh, television, radio, of, or children playing. This is uh, because uh, all this noise, such as television, radio, and children, uh, mask the low frequencies. So if a patient has a, a, a hearing loss in high frequencies, which usually is a, a 35 decibels in a frequency of a three kilohertz. So when, when they have difficulties to participate in conversation in background noise, uh, you have an indication that they have a moderate or worse hearing loss. So asking one of those two questions in a consultation will give you an indication of any hearing difficulty which may need further examination in primary or secondary care. There are some new developments in this area. So the World Health Organization has asked the governments to initiate some screening programs in primary care. But these uh, two simple questions uh, can be a good first step, a good start for self-reported hearing difficulties. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, Corinne has just said, but you mentioned they think that they are all right with no issues. Is there a tool that we can use that is objective? There is a, uh, the case that they may answer that they have a good, very good or excellent hearing in the first question in the five uh, point Likert scale. But if they answer yes in the question whether they find it difficult to follow in conversation if there is a background noise, such as a television, radio, or children playing, this shows that they indeed have a hearing problem. So this will give you an idea that they may need a referral or further examination. Regarding the tool, uh, the uh, objective uh, measure I used in the English Longitudinal Study of uh, Aging uh, is called a hearing screener. Uh, is a screening tool 
that is used uh, by several uh, GP practices. But uh, I guess that if there is a national program, the government will decide on a specific uh, tool to be used uh, from all primary care professionals. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any other questions? Uh, Komal said, do you recommend medical students to learn basic sign language? Uh, that could be useful. Um, to be honest, I attended classes and I'm uh, uh, professionally uh, uh, certified in Greek sign language. So I studied for five years in uh, Greece and learned the sign language in an advanced le uh, level. And that also motivated me to uh, seek further and uh, research further the many barriers that uh, people face uh, during the use or the access to health services. So during my courses, I uh, met many people. I became a, a member of a deaf community. Uh, this is a different aspect of uh, hearing difficulties because people uh, uh, who communicate in sign language consider themselves as members of a, a special uh, uh, community and different culture. Uh, so it would be nice to get uh, some awareness, to get familiarized, but uh, there were different uh, categories of people with hearing loss. There are people that uh, were born with a hearing loss and uh, probably communicate in sign language. But there is also a, a, a huge category of people with acquired hearing loss that uh, develop, have developed uh, uh, hearing difficulties across their life course. So at the moment, for example, we have just to, uh, a number to understand 100,000 uh, uh, people uh, who communicate uh, in sign language and 12 million people with, hearing, with acquired hearing loss. So it's useful so as to be able to communicate with uh, this uh, cultural minority who communicates in uh, sign language, but also the awareness uh, of hearing difficulties needs to, uh, to, to be applied to all categories, uh, either uh, acquired hearing loss or many other uh, subcategories of people with hearing difficulties. Thank you very much. And Sama has asked, how is the work-life balance within the ENT specialty? I think I'm not appropriate to answer that because I'm not <laughs> ENT, I'm a psychologist by background. So whoever has any idea could offer any opinion. Yeah, if, uh, if anyone in the chat wants to reply, but I don't think we're the best term. Um, um, Komal has just asked, do adverse childhood experiences affect hearing loss? Uh, yes, as you can, as depicted in the uh, model of hearing health inequalities, uh, adverse childhood experience may affect uh, the access to education, which then may affect uh, uh, income, uh, lower level uh, uh, manual jobs uh, are those uh, with uh, exposure to excessive noise, which is uh, again a risk factor for hearing loss. So there are so many factors uh, that if uh, uh, somebody is in a lower socioeconomic position early in life uh, has a, a likelihood to, to develop during the life course hearing difficulties. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalia. Um, I'm just aware that two people have left, so I just want to make sure we get the poll in and with everyone uh, present before everyone leaves. Um, so we're going to have another poll and um, just to see whether the opinion has changed. Um, so it's the same questions. I'm going to launch it now. And um, if you could just fill this poll out as well, please, um, so we can know um, if our talk has had any effect or any uh, changing on your opi opinions. And also um, make sure you do not leave um, because uh, the certificate will be emailed out with the feedback form, which will be placed in the chat. So make sure that you fill out the feedback form so you can get the certificates. Uh, while the poll is going, um, Hazel has asked how to overcome hearing difficulties with masks wearing, especially if I rely on lip reading. Uh, 
It's a good question. Yeah, this is a really challenging. And uh, I guess that uh, uh, many people with hearing difficulties uh, are struggling and, and realized, even realized during the pandemic that they had hearing difficulties uh, uh, because they realized how much they rely on lip reading. So I'm afraid that there is no way to overcome the difficulties, but there is a way to uh, be honest and communicate your needs uh, and uh, if possible to remove masks and keep some distance so as to be able to, uh, to, to keep uh, reading uh, lips. Uh, I think that in uh, uh, some occasions uh, there may be some understanding so, uh, so as if you ask uh, in a service uh, or uh, uh, somewhere you, you need to ask and to, to explain that you need to uh, read lips. I think that the person will understand because it's a two-way communication. And uh, the most important thing in communication is to clearly express your needs. I, this is the only thing I could advise. Uh, it's very challenging though. Mm -hmm. uh, I think even um, when I was in my clinical placements, actually every patient um, that I had seen that had hearing loss um, had already been used to saying, oh, could you speak a bit louder? I have hearing before I'd even started the consultation. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think stating your needs um, could be quite effective. Oops. Okay. Um, if any, if you could just, 15 people haven't filled out the poll. So if you could just do that real quick before we end. <clears throat> And then if um, Asta, if you're present, do you mind um, putting the feedback form into the chat, please? Um, yeah, I'll just do that. So um, once you fill in the feedback forms, you'll have the certificates available at the end. And I'm also putting a, putting a second link um, just to keep updated with the uh, Young Academic Society in general. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. And, uh, um, and yes, thank you very much. Um, so. Um, are there any other questions for um, Marwan and Dahlia before we end? I doesn't see. It doesn't seem like we'll have any more questions now. Um, so uh, I'll make. Um, I'll continue ending the event now. Um, so yes, thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. Um, um, and for hearing our speakers this evening. Um, so thank you, Dahlia. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you for putting this together for us. Um, it really does make you think about how much more we can make healthcare accessible for those hard of hearing, especially since um, there seems to be a much higher prevalence than we might think, and it also might not be as immediately obvious. Um, and it's wonderful to have someone so world renowned and passionate um, in the field of audiology and public health, um, like Dahlia, um, to give this talk for us today. Um, she's also our teaching supervisor for the series of talks, so um, it's lovely to have you on board. Um, I'd also like to, th to thank the um, Young Academics Committee, uh, Komal, Asta, Ryder, Elaine, thank you for organising the talk and promoting it. Thank you very much Marwan for giving us this wonderful talk alongside Dahlia. Mm -hmm. And also thank you very much to the participants. I hope you found this talk incredibly useful and that you've learned something new. Um, I definitely have. Um, I'd like to remind you that if you could please fill in the feedback form that we'll be sending out afterwards, it won't take it won't take you long at all. Um, along with the feedback form will be your certificates, as Marwan said, um, as well as uh, the recording, the slides, and links for future opportunities. Um, and keep an eye out on our social media for any changes because we post all of our activities and um, new opportunities and new talks there. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Casey. Thank you. So yeah, and the feedback form is right there in the chat just for you guys. Make sure you don't forget to do it for your certificate. Hi everyone, thank you very much. Is there